This is For the Governed, a podcast series brought to you by Athlon. Here are your hosts, Tim Markison and Ron Cates. Welcome to another very, very interesting Athlon's podcast. With me, as always, is the founder and CEO of Athlon's, Tim Markison. Tim and I, we both have a lot of background in, in sports science, I have a master's in exercise science, but we have very different perspectives on how those things, on how things work and the difference between physical science versus life science, and that's the topic for today. Yeah, I'm electrical engineer, that's what I was trained in, and then went on to law school to do patent law. So I was trained in, in the physical sciences, so physics, chemistry, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. I skipped all those things. Yep. And life scientists, you know, they, they study living things. Physical sciences study non-living things. So, now that I know you, by the way, I regret yeah. that I don't have that background because you have taught me so much. It's ridiculous. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so, you know, when I started looking at the athletics, you know, it's not surprising that um, athletes are studied by life scientists because uh, we are human beings and we are, you know, physically active. So the sports scientists, biomechanical engineers, kinesiologists, physical therapists, doctors, you know, all really have spent a lot of time, and that's where most of sports science comes from. And yet, from my perspective, bringing in the, the physical science part, that's, you know, there's you know, a, a key component of every, every athletic movement is you know, pushing off the ground, and that actually gets the athletic movement starting. That's all physics. So there's this interaction between life sciences and physical sciences when it comes to um, athletics. Well, the driving force behind both, though, is to figure out how things work. Just maybe a little bit different approach. Right, right. Yeah, so the, the point of all sciences is to understand how things work, uh, to be able to use that understanding to model how other things might work and to create new things. Um, you know, we start to get into the, the physical sciences. So I, I, in the blog, I talked about, you know, Newton as an example of his discovery or understanding of gravity. So, you know, he, and this is my hypothesis of what happened. I really don't know the exact nature of how all this went down. But, you know, I imagine him watching things fall to the ground. So he watched an apple and says, you know, why is that happening? And, and he started, created a hypothesis, which is where all science begins, is with a hypothesis. So, gee, I just witnessed this event happening. Why did that happen? So the potential answer to that is the hypothesis. So he hypothesized that it was gravity and then conducted experiments to, under, to verify his or test his hypotheses. So through experimentation, we either strengthen the hypotheses or we disprove the hypotheses. So with respect to gravity, clearly it, it proved it. Um, you know, part of the scientific process also is once a, st a study is done, experiment is done, you, you share that information with others. So they can, they can test and verify the hypothesis or disprove the hypothesis, conduct their own experiments, and then you start getting this collective knowledge. And that's, you know, that's really kind of the, the whole point of science is to grow the collective knowledge. So today we know that gravity exists. There's, he did mathematical modeling to figure out what's behind it. Right. And at some point it became replicated so many times it's, it's a law is that am i the right yeah yeah using the right term yeah there? so you know and that's the the interesting thing from my perspective with respect to the physical sciences is the experiments are a lot easier to control it's easier to do the mathematical modeling and you know once you get to a point where it's been ex a hypothesis has been extensively studied the results are always coming out to the same there's no known exceptions now that becomes a scientific law so with respect to gravity, the mathematical equations to predict how fast something's going to fall, the velocity at impact, all those things, um, you know, are scientific laws. Now, so what about things that there happens almost all the time, or or yeah. in almost everyone, but not every not every time? Yeah. So I, I classify those as a scientific statement. 
So there are hypotheses that has been tested, but not to the extent where they become scientific law. So again, for something to be a scientific law, it's always true. So you know, if I drop uh, an apple from this table, I can calculate that it's going it, to, well, it's going to fall to the ground. That's always going to happen. And I can calculate how fast it's going to fall and the velocity that it's going to have just before impact and then the impact force. And if I drop a million apples, they're all going to have the same mathematical characteristics, the same velocity, the same impact. So that's a scientific law. Now, when we start looking at, you know, the, the life sciences, you know, with respect to living things, there are very few scientific laws. Um, you know, we, we, need, we need nourishment, we need uh, water, and eventually we die. But how each person responds to various stimuli, there's just, it, it's, you can't say, you know, but for this one thing, everybody would respond the same way. Aspirin comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at aspirin, I mean, that's been around for quite some time. You know, it's, it's widely used. It's widely understood that, yes, for most people, it's um, anti-inflammatory. It helps reduce pain. And it also is a, a blood thinner, so it can help mitigate the effects of a heart attack. Now, from person to person, the amount of pain relief it provides, the amount of blood thinning it provides is going to vary. So it's not a scientific law that if you take this amount of aspirin, you will get exactly these results. It's going to be a, a range of results. And then for some people, it doesn't work at all. But it's been tested and used so many times that it creates a trustworthiness in that scientific statement. So for a majority of people, aspirin is going to be helpful. All right, so bringing this around to sports. Yeah. Usually in sports science, we either look at, hey, look, almost all elite athletes do it this way, so there must be something to that, or we do a test. But the problem with the test is that it, it's certainly very difficult mm -hmm. to get a population large enough mm -hmm. to draw a significant conclusion. I mean, yeah. you, you can only find you know, so many distance runners or golfers or baseball players to conduct any kind of test on. And then those are often skewed or biased because they're, they're college level or higher, which means they're elite, right. which means they're, they're physically different than um, the regular guy giving it a try, regular person right. giving it a try. Right. There's a big difference between a, a recreational runner and an elite runner. So I, in my viewpoint is that not everything that works for elite runners will work for an everyday runner. Right. Right. So, yeah, I mean, there are all types of uh, studies being done. So, you know, a as an example, uh, and this is kind of paraphrasing a study that I read, but it, it, it studied 20 uh, Division I college athletes, and they put them through this particular movement to see how much athletic performance that they would get. And it was a six-week program. And after the end of the six weeks, 70% of the athletes, or 14 of them, actually exhibited some improvement. There were uh, three or four that had no improvement, and then there was a couple that actually uh, it inhibited their performance. So now you have a, a scientific study because it was done in a manner. But you know, what's the truthfulness? How, how applicable is that to everybody? And that's where science starts to get convoluted. Because in that, in that study, it's, it's way low to me on the trustworthiness because it's just such a small cross-section of society. You know, we're talking about elite athletes, like you said, Division I college players. It was a very short program, and only 70% of the athletes showed improvement. Is that a sustained improvement, or was it just a, a, a blip? Um, and how much was that improvement? Was yeah. it significant it, it, or it small? It was a fraction of a percent, up to a, a, a percent or two. So it, it kind of varied from athlete to athlete. You know, but you know, here's where we have a lot of problem in, in, with science is, okay, you know, technically that was a scientific study. But now to say, okay, well, that's going to apply to you, me, and everybody else, that is a scientific uh, falsity. You can't say with any kind of certainty that that's going to work for a uh, cross-section of the population. It's just way too small. Uh, of a test sample, of a duration. So, you know, as more and more tests are done across greater and greater cross-sections of population and coming up with similar results, um, 
now you start to increase the trustworthiness of that study. But like you're saying, with sports, you know, so much of it is done looking at the elite player, the professional player, the college player. So to take those kind of studies and say with any kind of certainty that they'll work for the average athlete, that's a, that's a, a big... Well, they're elite athletes for a reason. They're yeah. physically different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've said this all the time. If, um, you know, if everybody could do it, it, we wouldn't pay to watch sports. I mean, we all walk down the street. You know, there's not a camera out there going, oh, look at so-and-so. Wow, look at that walk today. You know, we, we enjoy sports because they're elite, because they can do things that most people can't. I'll give you a really good example. Uh, I ran in college, and I was coaching this guy who uh, went on to become pretty famous. And he was a... Uh, legally blind, so he was a Paralympian. And at the Paralympics, he won a bunch of gold medals. His name is Carlos Talbot, still the world record holder for uh, uh, visually impaired marathoner. Um, mm. Carlos could take off six months, you know, quit the sport, put on a lot of pounds, come back, and in his first week, he'd go out in training, he could run 100 miles that week and not get hurt. Mm. If I increased my mileage by you know, 6% in a week, that was yeah. too much and I would fall apart. Yeah. So, you know, trying, this guy's really fast, so, oh, we should train like him? That's crazy because he's unique and different. That's why he's an elite athlete. Yeah. And, you know, and now this starts to set up a different uh, mentality between life scientists and physical scientists. You know, physical scientists, um, you know, like uh, for me as an engineer, electrical engineer, when I was designing a circuit, if I did my math right and built it right according to my design, it's going to work. I don't need to prove the science behind the math. It's already been done. You know, with respect to the life sciences, you know, there are just so many variables that you, you don't have that level of certainty. So that's why you have to have uh, um, all these studies and then growing and growing in studies and longer and longer studies and, and more cross sections of people to get to that level of trust trustworthiness in those scientific statements. Uh, sports, yeah. uh, sports are played by humans. Right. They're incredibly individual. It, motivation, the, their, their physiology is all very, very different. So that right. makes it way tougher to come uh, up with something valid. Absolutely. You know, in the physical sciences, especially like in, um, electric circuits, um, you know, I'll stick to what I really know. You know, I, I can look at this one component and say, if I change that, I know what's going to happen to the whole system because I can mathematically model it out. You know, you and I, we could eat the exact same thing, and our bodies are going to respond differently. You can't, with the human body, there's too many variables. The, the, was there 20 billion synapses or something like that in the brain? There's just way, I way, only have five. <laughs> there's way, way too many variables in the human body to say, but for this one thing, um, that wouldn't have happened. So it, it, creates this, this um, you know, distinction between, oh, well, we got to study everything to, well, no, no, we don't, because on the physical sciences, as long as I do the math right and I build it right to my design, it's going to work. And I can build a million of them. As long as I build it to that design, all a million are going to work. I don't need to go test every one and, and to the level of detail that you would do a study. On the life sciences, you have that difference. You know, so, you know, and, that, and that now actually starts to come into play here at Athlon's. I was going to say, at some point, you turned your attention, your in incredible background into golf, the golf swing, how shoes yeah. work, and it's all based on physics. Yeah. So when you look at our shoes, and we've talked about this before, but what we've done is we've looked at, you know, there's three main components from our standpoint, from a physical science standpoint. You know, how does the, the shoe interact with the ground? How does the foot interact with the shoe? And then what are the forces doing through the shoe between the foot and the ground? So those we can mathematically model and design to get more force going towards the body. And that's what we've done in ath uh, the Athlon shoes. So I've done the mathematical modeling. We've built a prototype. Yep, it works exactly like the math says. I don't need to do a million studies or even any extensive studies to go, yep, physics works. Now, when athletes start wearing that, when they get this 9% more power in their body, well, what are they doing with that? Well, now you're bringing in the human element and all the variables that go along with being a human being. So 
you know, we, we would have to do more and more studies on, well, what does an athlete do with 9% more power or more in their golf swing? How does it affect their golf swing? You know, we have a lot of, uh, of customers that use our shoes, and they give us feedback. Oh, I'm hitting the ball further. I have less misses. Well, some of those golfers are people yeah. like Bernard Langer and, and you know, right. Ken Duke, the, the long drive champions. Yeah. So, I mean, very pretty, pretty valid. Yeah. Very, very accomplished, very, very accomplished players. Um, you know, where, you know, the life scientists, um, you know, we, we're working with some uh, Major League Baseball teams right now. And their sports scientists guys are like, well, we need to study this. You know, what what is it really doing for the athlete and things like that? So that's something that we really are embarking on now. You know, but and, everybody who's tried the shoes, and there's been dozens of them, yeah. uh, you know, professional baseball players, are they notice the difference as soon as they put them well, on immediately? So they'll feel the physics. Now, what the body does with that extra percent, uh, extra nine percent uh, power, you know, that's that's going to vary. And, and that's where the sports scientists want to do the study. So how much, how much better are they going to play with that 9% more power? You know, and then, you know, with respect to folks that are using, you know, our, our golf shoes and or our baseball shoes, uh, conduct your own study. You know, take your shoe um, and any other, any other golf shoe or baseball shoe and, and go hit balls. And, you know, measure your distance, measure how accurate you are in our shoes and others, and, you know, we'd love to hear that.